Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Nirav Pandya from San Francisco, California. Dr. Pandya is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist within the UCSF Department of Orthopedic Surgery and is also the section chief of the Division of Pediatric Orthopedics. Originally from Chicago, Dr. Pandya received his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago. Dr. Pandya then went on to complete his orthopedic surgery residency at the Hospital for the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He then completed a fellowship in pediatric orthopedic surgery at the Raddy's Children's Hospital in San Diego, California. Dr. Pandya has authored over 60 peer-reviewed publications and has multiple book chapters and speaks regularly at national and international conferences. If you notice, Dr. Pandya has delivered several lectures on our channel, and today is my great honor to bring back Dr. Nirav Pandya for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Nirav. Great. Well, thank you uh, for having me again. And, and today I'll be talking about uh, osteochondral lesions of the elbow. Um, this is a very common injury that we see, particularly in upper extremity athletes. So um, we will go ahead and kind of talk a little bit about the general workup of, of injuries in throwing athletes. And then we'll take a deep dive into um, these lesions and, and what exactly they are and how we treat them. So I think the important thing whenever you are, are treating anyone who has an osteochondral lesion of the elbow is to understand the context in which they're doing their activities. So very rarely will you see patients who come in um, who have these lesions that are simply not athletes. You know, typically this is an injury of particularly of baseball players and gymnasts doing a lot of repetitive upper extremity activity and they'll get these injuries. And I think it's important for you to understand what an osteochondral lesion is and, and what it actually is, is an injury to the cartilage and bone. And typically what will happen is that during some period of development, um, the cartilage and bone doesn't have good blood supply. The area becomes a little bit weaker and you combine a weaker area of cartilage and bone with someone who does repetitive upper extremity activities, such as baseball or gymnastics. Um, and then they get this injury. So in general, when we look at youth athletes, we see that elbow injuries and, and the need for surgery are rapidly increasing young athletes. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that kids are playing one sport repetitively, uh, particularly at a club, very specialized level. And there are lots of different surgical techniques that have been described and outcomes for these elbow injuries. Um, we'll take a deeper dive in that in the second half of the talk. Now, I think before we dive into the specific pathology, I think it's important to understand why this is actually occurring. If you look 20, 30 years ago, you know, elbow OC lesions were described, but you didn't necessarily see it to the same level that we see now, where I'll see 5, 10, 15 patients a month who have osteochondral lesions. Now, when we look here in the United States, there's a huge culture of sports specialization where younger and younger patients are basically playing individual sports because they want to become professional athletes or get a scholarship. And this is an article here from the New York Times that basically talked about how sports training has begun for babies and toddlers, where parents are getting their two, three, four-year-olds into these classes, not just to have fun, but to play individual sports. But then you get to see these kids who are engaged in this at age three, four, and five, and you talk to them as teenagers and they say, I'm trying to throw very fast. I'm trying to kick a soccer ball really, really well. But then they're getting surgeries at age 12, 13, and 14. And these are surgeries that you would typically see, you know, 10, 15 years ago in 20, 25 year olds. And a lot of these kids are saying, is it really worth it? Is it worth having these traumatic injuries in this case to their elbow to continue playing sports? And I think what reflects this a lot is that there are many multiple books that have been written about how arm injuries, particularly in baseball players here in the United States, have become so prevalent in younger and younger individuals in how much concentration there is on, you know, amongst parents and coaches about creating this golden athlete or golden child who can then go on to make the major leagues and make lots of money, whereas 90% of kids who are on this path will actually get injured and have, you know, Tommy John surgery or have an injury to the osteochondral area of the elbow as well, too. And a lot of this is fed by sports culture, particularly amongst baseball and gymnastics, where people are basically fed into these, what we call showcases, where they're throwing a lot, they're trying to perform. Um, and what happens, they're really not really getting a scholarship. What they're doing is actually tearing up their elbow and then coming into us to get treatment for their injuries. And I think part of this as well, too, is as clinicians who see athletes who have these injuries, even though we'll talk about how you treat an OCD lesion of the elbow and how you basically can, you know, you know, rehab afterwards. I think it's important to understand to counsel coaches, parents, and families that come in and understand that the best way to actually treat this injury is to never have it. And a lot of parents need to hear the fact that very few high school athletes will actually get a scholarship. And even if they do get a scholarship, it's only going to be $11,000 on average here in the U.S. over four years. So is it worth having a severe cartilage injury in your elbow by throwing for 30 hours a week or by doing gymnastics for 40 hours a week when the chance of you actually getting to that next level is very, very small? <laughs> 
And if we look at surgeries in general, and this is just Tommy John surgeries in the elbow, but if you also look at elbow um, osteochondral injury surgeries, you can see that over the past 20 to 30 years, um, there's been a tremendous increase, almost 30 to 40% increase of uh, the number of surgeries that are being done. So I think it's important to recognize that this isn't just something that we're just seeing more of because we're getting more MRIs. We're actually seeing more severe pathology that actually is requiring surgical intervention. And even our orthopedic academy is basically you know, creating promotional messages that are basically saying, look, there are a lot of injuries that we're seeing. We need to make sure that kids are enjoying sports, not getting these injuries. So I think in general, when you're seeing these athletes, it's important not just to concentrate on the MRI or the x-ray, but look at the context that they're playing in. And a lot of this has to do with things that are a little bit out of our control, where only 5.5 million children in the U.S. are playing in school sports, but the vast majority of them are playing you know, sports uh, basically outside of school, which is where the problem is coming from. And they're not doing basic physical education classes. They're not working on stretching. They're not working on core strength. They're not working on, you know, learning how to play multiple different sports. They're basically learning how to just engage in a skill-based activity, which is the number one preventative thing for these type of elbow osteochondral injuries is that kids playing multiple sports, not throwing year round, not playing tennis year round, not basically doing gymnastics year round for 40 hours a week. You can prevent these injuries from developing, even if there is a predisposition, by limiting the amount of force across that elbow. And the best way to do that, just have kids play sports, have them go out there, go out in the backyard, play things, so they're not creating these large cartilage injuries in their elbow. Um, and this really is reflective of a trend we need to change here, particularly in the United States, but you are seeing in other countries as well, too is where you have nearly a quarter of all youth sports participants in the US only playing one sport, which is a tremendous amount of, of kids. When I was growing up, you played multiple sports. It was actually great. You were It was seen positively to play multiple sports and succeed in multiple sports, but now kids are concentrating at younger, younger ages. And as a result, what happens is they're either getting injured or they're dropping out of sports because they just don't like the pressure anymore. And you can imagine kids shouldn't be dropping out of sports at age 13. They shouldn't be getting an elbow arthroscopy at age 12. Um, but but this culture has basically led to this, um, and it's important to counsel patients about basically emphasizing them to be healthy, active individuals as opposed to developing skills. And it's the development of skills that leads to these upper extremity injuries. We're not weight-bearing on our upper extremities. You can imagine that it's really repetitive stress that's causing that, where the, and it's particularly upper extremity sports that are leading to this. So the number one thing you can do besides counseling patients in general um, about the risks of this is just make sure you understand what they're doing and that's they're basically playing in an individual sport year round. So if you can stop that, then you can get to the point where you can actually even prevent the lesion or actually avoid surgery from the get-go. Now, the difficulty we have as clinicians, and we'll, we'll jump in more into the specifics in a second about how to treat these injuries, is that we're kind of faced with this large youth sports complex where basically youth sports have become a $15 billion injury. So we can counsel the coaches, we can counsel parents, we can counsel families, but there's this pressure. Everyone's playing baseball, everyone's doing gymnastics, everyone is pushing through with their elbow pain. Um, and there's a lot of money invested in it and patients and families naturally feel that they need to jump along, they need to be with this process. But by the time they've realized that they're hurting their elbows, they're hurting their ACLs, it's become much more of a difficult thing to do. But it's important to share this data. You share data such as this from Dr. James Andrews. It says that if you throw with fatigue, you're basically going to the point where you're throwing 20, 30 hours a week, you're throwing tons of pitches. There's a 3,600, three, excuse me, 3,600 percent increase in the chance of throwing shoulder or elbow injuries. So these are things that we need to let individuals know. Yes, it's important for us to counsel on what an elbow OCD lesion is, what the surgical options are, what the treatments are for it. But the best way to prevent this injury is to make sure that kids aren't getting to the point where they're playing too much sports and then they're getting these osteochondral lesions. Now, kind of honing down into what we're seeing in kids, when you have a throwing athlete, and this is also true for athletes who do a lot of gymnastics, the issue is that pain and fatigue are really what are driving the development of these injuries. So for example, this is a survey that was done at Columbia University that looked at 200 youth baseball pitchers. 75% of them, when they surveyed them after them, had pain fatigue while throwing, 80% had pain the day after, and 50% were encouraged to stay in the game even with pain and fatigue. And I say with upper extremity injuries, particularly with individuals who are having lateral sided pain, but also medial sided pain as well too, that that's the number one warning sign that the athlete is overdoing it and may potentially be on the road or may have already developed a cartilage lesion or a medial sided ligament injury. And the fact that there is a culture that promotes it is problematic. So prevention is not necessarily just exercises, rest, it's 
making sure that kids aren't throwing with pain. So if you're seeing kids for other issues, you're seeing patients in your clinic and parents ask you, well, what's one sign that my athlete or my young child may be hurting themselves? Pain and fatigue are really, really key, whether they're saying that they're feeling that there's soreness or weakness in their upper extremity, or they're having sharp pain, that's a sign that they are doing too much and can potentially have developed a lesion or maybe on the way to basically developing that as well too. So in general, and this is important to share with parents and families, particularly print out papers and give it to them, is that understanding that specialization and playing an individual sport playing that baseball, playing that tennis, playing that gymnastics has been proven in our data. We have multiple of them to actually lead to more injuries, whether that be upper extremity injuries or lower extremity injuries. There's tons of data that actually shows that not specializing will actually lead to better athletic performance and also lead to preventative injury. And if there's any statistic that you remember in general, if you have an upper extremity athlete or even a lower extremity athlete, a lot of parents will ask, well, how much sports is too much? There was a great study done by Neuro Gianti that basically looked at athletes and found that for athletes between the ages of eight and 19, if you spend more hours per week playing your sport than your age, you're 70% more likely to experience a severe injury. So in general, when I get that 11-year-old baseball player in, I get that 12-year-old baseball player in, and they're saying, look, how many hours per week should I be playing? I say, look, if you're 11 years of age, you should only be doing 11 hours of organized activity. If you're eight, it should be eight hours of organized activity. If you go over that, you're more likely to experience severe injury. And I think when parents can kind of hear that, they can quantify it. Because when I say don't play too many sports, they may be like, what does that mean? My kid loves it. You know, We've got two hours of sports every weekend. Uh, excuse me, every day. But in this case, you can actually quantify it a little bit more for them. And that has been shown both in this study and a subsequent study as well, too, to hold true. So putting this all together from a counseling standpoint, before we take a deep dive into the elbow in terms of history, physical, et cetera, the most important thing besides understanding what these lesions are, and we'll talk about specifics in terms of treatment, the best way to keep upper extremity athletes from even developing these or having them successfully be treated non-operatively is to basically have them play multiple sports. I can't under overemphasize that enough. Excuse me, underemphasize that enough. You need to make sure that kids are doing multiple sports so that they aren't getting these injuries. That's the most important thing you can do, even when you're seeing them for non uh, sports medicine type injuries. Delay sports specialization until at least age 15, encourage them to play multiple sports and have them take time off. Okay. Now, going specifically, we're going to transition now into general counseling about the from the culture of what causes these athletes to develop these injuries to looking specifically at the upper extremity athlete and what you're going to do in the clinic. So when an athlete comes in and they have an upper extremity injury, particularly in the pediatric population, before we even go down the route of diagnosis, there are basically three main factors that basically lead to upper extremity injuries. As we mentioned, overuse poor lower extremity and core strength. And I want to emphasize that, that a lot of times kids will be overusing their upper extremity because they lack lower extremity strength. And that can be a risk factor for development as well as poor mechanics. One and two are extremely important. The parents will come in and concentrate on number three a lot because they're very, you know, coming from a skill-based perspective. But I think it's important to really look at we talked about number one, but also look at number two as well too. And then three is kind of something that comes in tertiary after you've addressed those other factors. Okay. So athlete comes in, you're kind of working them up for an elbow injury. Okay. What are some of the key history questions? Okay. So you want to differentiate insidious and dull pain versus sharp and traumatic pain. So typically insidious and dull pain is going to be more of a generalized kind of overuse type injury that's more muscular related. But if they have sharp and traumatic pain, you get concerned. Same thing with kind of diffuse, it hurts all over the elbow versus very localized pain where they can point with the finger. If they have pain before and after throwing, there you're more concerned about fatigue type issues without an underlying structural issue versus if they have pain during throwing, that's where you get worried about an osteochondral lesion. And if they have normal mobility, that's typically more going to be your medial epicondyle kind of you know irritation, kind of little league shul, uh, elbow versus if they have locking instability and stiffness. That's where you get more concerned about a osteochondral lesion or a larger intraarticular injury that may be occurring. So a lot of times these kids, particularly because they're so keyed in in terms of how their, their body feels, whether it be a throwing athlete such as a pitcher or an upper extremity athlete like a gymnast, their history is really, really key to kind of drive you towards what the diagnosis is. Other things you want to get a sense of is how much volume that they're doing, right? So if, if a kid comes in and says, look, I play one hour sports per week and my elbow's hurting, that doesn't necessarily 
is consistent with an osteochondral lesion. Um, but if they're coming in, they're saying they're, they're throwing, you know, 300 pitches a week, they're doing 45 hours of gymnastics a week, then, then you got to get concerned that there may be something like that developing. Also getting a sense of what they actually do. So for, I use an example for a baseball player, if you're playing third base or second base, you may not necessarily be as much of a risk and you're thinking of a different pathology by someone as opposed to someone who's a pitcher or a catcher. And that can basically indicate that they're doing a lot of throwing. You want to get a sense of how long their pain persists. So typically with osteochondral lesions of the elbow, they'll have very sharp pain that then subsequently then goes away versus someone who has pain that kind of lasts for hours at a time. Get a sense of their sports participation. So a kid may say, look, I, I only throw or, or only do an hour a week with this one team, but then they're playing on four different teams or at three different clubs in terms of gymnastics. Get a sense of what they're doing. So for pitchers, get a sense of like what they're throwing. For gymnasts, what apparatus are they using? Or if you had a tennis player, like what strokes are they doing when it's hurting? Get a good sense of where they're actually loading their elbow and how they're doing it. And that can help you get a sense of what's going on. Um, and then get a sense of their overall culture. Like, is their parent here? Are they, who are they working with? Are they taking any supplements? And one of the things that we found, interestingly enough, is look at a prior history of musculoskeletal problems. And one of the things we found, and we're, we're publishing a case series on this, is that individuals who had elbow fractures at a young age, supracondylar fractures, lateral condyle fractures, are also at risk for developing osteochondral lesions in the elbow just due to the, the potentially the surgery itself they had in the past or due to abnormal anatomy. So if a kid comes in, he's 14, 15, or 16, and saying, look, I have elbow pain. And they said, you know, actually, when I was five, six, or seven, I actually broke my elbow or had a pinning. That can be a risk factor as well, too, because we know the elbow anatomy is already a little bit abnormal um, as well, too. So take, make sure you're taking that into consideration uh, when you're working up patients as well, too, because a lot of times the reason why they may have also developed the osteochondral injury may be due to the fact that they have abnormal alignment from a prior injury. And also look at family history as well, too, to see if there's a family history of osteochondral lesions. And thinking about very specific questions, if you want to remember, in terms of throwing athletes, if they have decreasing velocity, they have loss of control, increasing fatigue, they're having knee and hip pain, or for gymnasts, they're feeling like they can't do their maneuvers as well. These are things that I think it's important to really key in on because you're going to get a lot of kids in your clinic who are saying that they have multiple joint pain. They say, my elbow hurts, my knee hurts, my ankle hurts, and you can't get x-rays on everyone. But if they're specifically talking about a decrease in function and an in increase in pain beyond baseline in that particular elbow joint, that's where you're going to be more aggressive, potentially get imaging and work these up, as opposed to a kid who comes in and says, my elbow's hurt, my knee's hurt, my ankle's hurt. And you're like, oh, maybe this is all just growth related. Okay. Um, in terms of things that parents may share, these are just some general recommendations in terms of pitching limits. I think this all goes in the context of getting a sense of how much activity they're doing in terms of managing them both. You know, if you go down surgical route or non-surgical route, get a sense of how much they're doing. Um, USA Little League, Major League Baseball has lots of different, you know, recommendations in terms of how many pitches you'll be throwing, what age you throw different pitches. There are also recommendations from USA Gymnastics for kind of how much activity they'll be doing. Same thing for tennis. So just keep a sense of making sure that you're covering all bases in terms of the workup and getting a sense of how much volume and intensity they're doing. There've been multiple studies that have talked about how overuse, et cetera, are related to the development of these injuries. And I think it's just something to keep in mind and why you're really looking for this in your history portion. Um, this was a study done um, by Dr. Andrews out of, of their institute, looking at what was actually leading to shoulder and elbow injuries. And one of the important things they felt saw was, as we've talked about before, playing more and having more pitches led to increased injury. This is another study they did as well too, and found that overuse and fatigue was associated with injury. So when you're throwing too much and you start getting tired, it leads to breakdown of mechanics and you can start developing more elbow injuries, throwing faster and also pitching in these showcases, which means basically trying to throw high velocity and trying to show your skill to get a scholarship leads to the development of these injuries. And once again, another issue looking, you know, another study looking at the same sort of uh, issues in terms of overuse, finding that if you threw more than 100 innings a year, you had a 3.5 times injury risk. So once again, just reemphasizing this again and again and again, it's about overuse, it's about volume is the best way to prevent these from occurring. But unfortunately, sometimes you're going to get kids in who actually have these injuries as well too. So we're kind of now down to the fact where you've got your history, you've got kind of the general context of when athletes are playing, what, what are you seeing around the elbow itself? So in general, I always like to say where an individual athlete, particularly around the elbow hurts, is going to really lead you to the diagnosis. So if you have medial sided pain, it's going to be a little league elbow. You have more pain anteriorly, it's going to be more biceps related. And if it's lateral sided pain, it's usually going to be a capitellar osteochondral lesion. 
Occasionally when kids get posterior pain, that can sometimes be a capitella or osteochondral lesion as well too, depending on where it's located. It can also be triceps tendonitis. So I think where their sore is going to lead you where the diagnosis may be, may be, but typically all pretty consistently, osteochondral lesions of the capitellum will give you lateral sided pain. Other things you want to check as well too is look for internal rotation deficits in the shoulder. One of the things that can happen is if kids lack internal rotation of their shoulder, they're going to abnormally place additional stress on their shoulder and elbow joint, and that can lead to more problems with the elbow as well too. So number one, besides examine the elbow, also look at the shoulder as well too. And third thing you want to do is also assess their lower extremity strength because if kids are weak in their core or in their lower extremity, they're going to try to generate velocity and speed from their arm, particularly by throwing abnormally, and that's going to lead them to have these injuries as well too. So that's something you want to assess in the clinic, whether that be single leg squats, look at their flexibility in terms of their popliteal angles and to test their core stability. And the last thing I say is assess biomechanics. So a lot of times, particularly if kids are throwing sidearm or they have some sort of abnormal throwing motion, a lot of parents will bring them in. If you see something that's grossly abnormal, I think it's important you can mention it to the parents, but I do think that as part of a return to play program after you've treated these individuals, I think it's important to get them hooked up with someone who actually can look at upper extremity biomechanics, whether that's a physical therapist you have, there's some pitching coaches as well too, or, or kind of like uh, athletic trainers you can help with this as well too, because you also want to make sure that after you do an intervention or treat them, they are basically not going to be stressing the area again because they've got some sort of abnormal mechanics. So other key history and physical findings that'll lend it to more having an elbow OCD, they're going to have typically an insidious onset of pain. They're typically not going to have trauma because it's usually related to overuse. One of the key things they'll say is that they feel like they have popping and my elbow gets stuck. And as I mentioned, it's typically going to be your gymnasts, your tennis athletes, or your baseball players. This kind of demonstrates what the two pathologies are. Typically from over compression is where you're going to get osteochondral lesions and from tension, you're going to get apophysitis. So that kind of gives you a sense of why these two areas develop. So when you're throwing, um, you have a lot of torque across your elbow. Your distal humerus is basically hitting up um, the capitellar region is basically hitting up against the radial head and you're going to get compression and capitellar osteochondral lesions. Other things to consider in general, when an athlete has an elbow injury, um, what the differential diagnosis is. There's a condition called Panner's disease, which is typically going to happen in your seven, eight, nine, 10 year olds. It's going to look like an osteochondral lesion, but their activity level and, and their symptomatology uh, won't be consistent with it. And that usually resolves with time. You can get medial apophysitis. You can get a lecronine apophysitis. You can get um, ulnar nerve symptoms. You can get muscle strains. There's a whole wide variety of pathologies, but typically the physical exam will lend you to it combined with the imaging. And I think when you're looking at an elbow image, it can be hard with a pediatric patient to know what's a growth plate, what's a fracture. But if you really hone it down to the two pathologies, you're either going to have pain on the inside of the elbow or on the outside of the elbow. The most common thing on the inside of the elbow is going to be little league elbow or medial epicondyl apophysitis. What you're going to see on an x-ray, and I do think that when you get an athlete in who is having elbow pain is very specific. I think it's important to at least get a plain film. What you're going to see is widening of the, apophys uh, the medial epicondyl apoph apophysis. And you can see that here on, on this x-ray. You're going to see this widening apophysis. Very rarely do you need to get an MRI if they have medial sided pain. The only reason you would want to get an MRI is if you're concerned about an ulnar collateral ligament injury, or they haven't uh, basically responded to treatment for medial sided elbow pain, or if you're concerned about an osteochondral lesion. Now, it's important to understand that a lot of parents will come in and say, I have little league elbow. It's important to understand that lateral sided elbow pain with a capitellar OCD is not little league elbow. It is a capitellar osteochondral lesion. And typically what you're going to see on x-ray, you're going to see a lucency along the capitellum. Um, and typically with these patients, you do want to get an MRI. Part of the reason being is you're going to get a sense of the stability of the lesion. So basically what that means is that if you have a lesion there, you want to make sure that there's not any fluid behind it. Because if it's an unstable lesion, it's typically going to have a poor outcome or require surgical intervention. You also want to make sure there is anything loose floating around in the elbow. And you're also looking for a, get a sense of what the overlying cartilage and bone quality is and see if there's any kind of cystic formation as well too. So this is kind of the x-ray will lead you down the route of, of what the next step will be. And if you if you do are concerned about a capitellar osteochondral lesion, or you have medial sided elbow pain that hasn't responded to non-operative treatment, or you're concerned about a ulnar collateral ligament injury, then you'll get an MRI. Okay. And this is what a capitellar osteochondral lesion will look like on arthroscopy. It literally is a pothole or a divot where the cartilage bone has been impacted. Um, that is something that needs to be treated, particularly if it's in a, of, of a large size. Okay. So in general, here are some more examples of capitellar osteochondral lesions on MRI. You can see um, 
typically what you'll see is you'll see loss of the cartilage, you'll see sometimes cyst formation, and then arthroscopically you'll see loose bodies that need to be removed that are blocking elbow motion. And because the elbow is such a small space, even a small loose body um, can block motion, and typically these loose bodies will generally find themselves into the olecranon fossa, and they're typically easy to move out. It's also important to understand is that when you have a capitellar osteochondral lesion, you have basically cartilage loss and potentially bone loss on the capitellum. You can also get radial head lesions as well too. You can imagine just like a knee joint, if you have a lesion on your femur, if there's increased stress on it, you can then subsequently then get a almost a kissing, kissing lesion on the other surface as well too. So it's important to look for these as well too, both on MRI and also arthroscopically as well too, to make sure you're addressing all cartilage injuries that are present so that even after intervention, athletes don't continue to have pain. So we look at individuals who have elbow OCD lesions. What, what's the, the demographics? Like who is particularly going to be the people who are most at risk of it um, beyond just the imaging that you may get in the clinic? And this was a study that was done by Kevin Shea, um, basically looking at um, the epidemiology of people who have uh, elbow OCD lesions, particularly children and adolescents. They found that males were at seven time risk. Typically 12 to 19 year olds were the highest risk, 22 times more than six to 11 year olds. And um, I think that's a good sense of when you feel you may need to do more workup or what the diagnosis may be. If you get a seven year old in versus a, a adolescent who likely has an OCD lesion, the majority of them were right-sided lesions. And that makes sense because most people are right-handed and are right-hand dominant. And non-Hispanic white males had the highest instance. So this gives you a sense of kind of like the demographic is who this may basically be. So this patient's come in, you've got your x-ray that shows an OCD lesion, you've got your MRI, what are the treatment options for this pathology? And they basically have five different treatment options. You can treat these non-operatively, you can fix these lesions, you can remove any kind of loose pieces and kind of clean things out with the debridement. You can remove them in microfracture, or you can do an um, autologous transfer. There are also some cartilage restoration procedures as well too. So in general, when parents ask, okay, my son or daughter has an OCD lesion. What's the general prognosis? And this was a study back done in 2007 that said that osteochondral lesions that have a good outcome are stable, uh, meaning that there's not fluid behind them. You have open growth place, which means you've got a lot of room left for growth. And they're just localized flattening or lucency, and you have good elbow motion. Poor outcomes are ones that are unstable. They have closed growth plates, they're fragmented, and you have restricted range of motion. So this kind of holistically gives you a sense of what the actual uh, what the actual prognosis will be. So if you have a group of individuals that you're going to think about treating non-operatively, particularly if it's a stable lesion, it's small, they're really young, they've got a lot of growth remaining, um, what do you typically do? So this was a study that looked out of Japan that looked at conservative treatment for stable OCD lesions. And what they actually found that immobilizing the elbow for a period of time, particularly with a cast, would lead these stable OCD lesions to heal as long as there's open growth remaining. So typically in, in my practice, you have an individual who gets an MRI, it's a small lesion, there's no fluid behind it, which means it's stable, and they've got a lot of growth remaining. And typically that can vary from person to person. That could be like a, a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old. It's reasonable to try casting followed by cessation of, of throwing activities or upper extremity activities, and you could potentially have a good, good outcome in terms of non-operative treatment. Um, this is another study that was done out of Boston Children's. Look at what are some of the factors that would lead you to have success with non-operative treatment. Um, and typically, these are lesions that are smaller, don't have cyst formation. Um, that would be another marker of, of good of good outcomes of non-operative uh, uh, non-operative treatment. So once again, on MRI, if you don't see a cyst, it's small. Maybe non-operative treatment would work. And then what are some of those factors that look at when you get a patient that they're not going to be successful in terms of treatment of these lesions. And um, as we've kind of talked about before, typically advanced skeletal age, uh, radiocapitellar incongruity, meaning that basically the, the radius and the capitellum, there's enlargement of, of, of the radial head, which means that there's not going to be a good pro prognostic factor, or if you have unstable lesions. So I think in general, the worst thing you want to do is basically then, you know, put, I mean, not the worst thing is would be choosing the wrong treatment or not recognizing it, but taking a lesion which likely has no ability or very minimal ability to heal non-operatively, cast them, doing all this treatment for three, four, five, six months, and then you go down the surgical route anyway, and then another four, five, six month um, uh, a period of time. So obviously you always want to try to treat any kind of lesion in a pediatric patient non-operatively, but if those risk factors exist for it not healing early on. Um, that's something that you need to take into consideration.
So then you go down the route of surgery. Okay. Um, what's the incidence of surgery in general? And then we'll talk about the specific surgical options. So in terms of progression of surgery for OCD lesions in general, the elbow is the most common OCD lesion that progresses the surgery. 55% risk of that. If you have an OCD lesion, it's going to need surgery. The knee is about 33% and the ankle is about 31%. Okay. But the key thing is that there are tons of different procedures. There's chondroplasty, drilling, microfracture, fixation, oats, loose body removal, bone grafting. So when do you use each of these different treatments? And I think the way you think of it is what is the potential failure rate with these treatments that helps you choose the right one? Very rarely do you do procedures where you're basically just taking a loose body out, not doing anything else. This You have to treat the cartilage lesion. So in rare cases, if there's just a loose body and the patient is very low demand, can you just go in there arthroscopically, take it out, let them get back to their activity? Most of the time you need to do something to restore that cartilage because these are active individuals. So option number one is fixation. You can actually fix this area, particularly if it's not, if it's good quality cartilage and you feel like you've got a good bony bed for healing. The outcomes of this, where you can get to them early, have a high return to sport rate, and typically you're using absorbable fixation. There's a high rate of clinical healing, but the key thing is you need to catch these early. So you need a lesion that's not basically falling off. It's swollen. You need good blood supply behind that area over there, but there are options in terms of bioabsorbable fixation. So basically going there, there arthroscopically and fixing them back almost like a fracture and getting them to heal. Then the next level is looking at, well, you know, some patients may get fixation, some patients get microfracture, like that's the next level of treatment. This is a review we did several years ago of our OCD lesions. And we actually found that even though a small percentage of them did have fixation, the vast majority of them had microfracture. Although a lot of them healed radiographically, they had low clinical returns to sport. And that was particularly in the baseball and gymnastic athletes. So if you play football, you lacrosse, softball, you're a multi-sport athlete, pretty much everyone returned to sport. But if you're a base, baseball player or a gymnast, you had a hot, low return to sport rate after microfracture and fixation. So I think a lot of this has to do with how they're stressing their elbow after surgery. And that may not necessarily, you may need to counsel them about changing sport, but there are some other options that I'll talk about as well too. Now, specifically looking at debridement microfracture, which basically means going in there, arthroscopically taking out anything that's loose, cleaning out the osteochondral lesion, and then basically making microscopic holes in it. If you look at this data, you, this was a, a retrospective review that looked at 77 patients. And they looked at patients with open growth plates, loose, who had loose bodies and short duration of symptoms. They actually did really well. Even though they clinically look good, 60, only 62% of them were able to return to sport. This is another study that looked at microfracture and drilling as well too. This was 21 patients. Only about 70% of patients healed, only about 60% of patients returned to sports, 90% had repeat surgery. So in general, arthroscopy, microfracture drilling doesn't necessarily lead to the best outcomes in terms of return to sport. It is an option, it's relatively quick, but I think it's important to counsel patients about the outcomes of this. The gold standard in terms of good outcomes is osteochondral autograph treatment. And there've been multiple studies that have looked at this and they've found that there's a high return to elite sporting activity. There's a high rate of healing. And um, in general, they've shown minimal donor site morbidity from the knee, but sometimes you can also use allograft as well too. In general, you're restoring the cartilage. You're basically getting aut autologous material inside there. And there's a high return to sport, particularly for your higher level athletes. The important thing for parents to understand, it's a much larger procedure. So a lot of them won't want to go down that route initially. But if you do have a higher level athlete that has this, this is usually the gold standard in terms of leading to return to high level elite sporting activity, where you're taking cartilage from the knee or using the allograft cartilage and bone, placing it in there through an open incision, and you get very high return to sports and radiographic healing as well too. If you look in general return to sport after this, this has also been shown in studies as well too, and particularly in meta-analyses. And you basically found that individuals who get uh, autograph transfers, basically getting cartilage bone transplanted in there, had the highest return to sport level as compared to debridement or fixation. So I think it's important to understand where you're counseling families, and then you have to make the best decision together in terms of what you're going to do. So when we think about treatment options, keep in the back of your mind, what group is most susceptible to have failure in terms of their treatment in general? Older patients, longer duration of symptoms, closed growth plates, high level upper extremity sport athletes, particularly baseball and gymnasts, and those who undergo debridement and microfracture. So, just things to keep in mind when parents ask you that. Now, a certain percentage of patients, as you've seen, who may get debridement, microfracture, other surgeries will actually fail. So, why do they actually fail? Why do they not return to sport? So, a lot of these patients will be non compliant. They won't do their home exercises. They go back to sport uh, too early. And it's once again, a key emphasis is that when you do these procedures on gymnasts and baseball players, you have to lay the crepe that there is going to be a potentially higher rate of failure. It's just a bad injury to get. And the best thing to do is not to get it in the first place. And that's why I spent so much time talking about limiting overuse.
So the most predictable treatment for failure is that you just have them change sports. If you get a baseball gymnast in and they fail their osteochondral lesion surgery, just say, look, we can either do another surgery or you can just go switch to basketball, switch to running. And I think that is the most predictable way to not have them need another surgery. Cause a lot of them, if you just don't do that upper extremity sport, they'll be totally fine clinically moving on to their life. But if you do have a higher extremity athlete who's more higher, high impact, upper level, what are the, some of the options? Well, if you try to fix a piece that was dead or non-viable, then you have to take it out, assess the size, and you may need an autograph, allograph tr- placement or some sort of Macy procedure. There have been studies, and even though we don't use Macy very typically here in the United States for elbow lesions, which is basically transferring cartilage that is basically grown in the lab, it has been shown that some of the loose bodies that you move doing elbow arthroscopy can be used to then basically then grow cartilage and then be reimplanted at a later time. The other thing you want to look at is potentially it was where the lesion was actually located was in your typical location. So if you had an OCD lesion um, that was located a little bit more uh, laterally than centrally, sometimes that lateral group will have worse outcomes than more a central located um, lesion. And and this study basically showed that um, if you looked at outcomes uh, for OATS uh, with unstable OCD, they were better for central lesions than lateral lesions. In more patients, the lateral group had post-operative radial head subluxation and arthritic changes. So sometimes even before surgery, when you see a certain change on an MRI, um, it can be more indicative of excuse me, when you get that MRI, get an indicative of a poor outcome. The other thing you want to also look for is radial head lesions. Um, a lot of times, as I mentioned, there'll be a kind of a, a kissing lesion, and that could be a reason why you have outcome as well too. Or it can be a, a lesion that was a little bit less typical where you have a radial head lesion without a capitellar lesion. You also want to assess alignment as well too. A lot of times alignment, just like we think in the knee, can cause osteochondral lesions to fail or, or increase forces across it. This is a study that we did looking at radiographic findings for patients who had elbow OCD, and we found that OCD patients had various carrying angles and increased valgus at the distal humeral articular surface. So just like with lower extremity osteochondral lesions, if you do have an issue in terms of alignment, that may be a reason for failure. I think the larger question is, which you don't really know, is do you treat these lesions like the knee? Do you do realignment osteotomies to offload cartilage, um, cartilage areas? There are some studies that have looked at closing wedge osteotomy where basically you're cutting the humerus to offload these lesions and they have had good outcomes, but I think that's a very kind of big jump to make uh, in a young athlete. There are also been studies that have basically looked at radial head shortening where you're basically offloading that area by shortening the radial head. Um, and this has been looked at more in terms of a theoretical uh, uh, you know, surgery that can be done. And there are some limited case reports that actually look at that. And finally, you also wanna look for litmus ligamentous injury. Sometimes if they have a medial collateral ligament injury or they have a, a lateral sided injury, that could be the reason why they have failure as well too. The key thing is just don't do the same thing again and again and again. And then postoperatively, whether in the primary setting or the revision setting, you want to extend the return to play timeline, have potentially have pay, athletes change their position of their baseball players. Maybe you don't want to be a pitcher. Maybe you don't want to be a catcher, just go in the field, address their mechanics, which are the modifiable risk factors, basically get them in a motion lab, have someone look at their, uh, their pitching or their throwing or their gymnastics in terms of how they're doing vaults or how they're using their arm to make sure they don't load those lesions again. So in general, when you talk about treating these elbow OCD lesions, you want to avoid failure in the first place. Obviously, you can counsel them, make sure they're not doing overuse, make sure they're playing multiple sports so they don't develop it in the first place. If they do develop it um, and you can't do non-operative treatment, you want to fix these lesions early. If you can get to them early before the pieces fall off, if you get to them late, don't try to fix them. Um, If you do do a procedure such as elbow arthroscopy with microfracture, there's really questionable return to sports. I think it's important to let parents know about that, particularly if they don't want to go through a larger procedure such as a cartilage transplant. You want to counsel patients and family about changing sports and volume. And in general, if you really do have a high demand athlete who wants to play at the next level, sometimes then going right to a primary osteochondral autograph procedure is is the best option for patients who have these injuries. And most importantly, I think the best thing you can do is make sure they don't develop them and understand this is a a really difficult injury for athletes to deal with and that you have all these various options for treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Nira, for that amazing presentation. Uh, Nira, actually, you can stop sharing your screen. Sure. Uh, Nira, uh, thanks for that uh, amazing talk. I mean, really informative, as usual. (laughs) Okay, a few questions, Nira. Sure. Uh, Mira, uh, a very common differential diagnosis that you mentioned was Spanner's disease, right? So right. someone who is looking at the elbow, how do you really differentiate clinically as well as radiologically? I mean, because if I'm right, the Spanner's disease runs a benign course and doesn't require any surgery. Isn't right. It? 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think, I think a lot of first, the number one thing is I think age, you know, typically the, the kids who come with panners are going to be your six, seven, eight, nine year olds. So, um, and so typically they'll be having kind of more diffuse elbow pain. Um, so that'll be number one, number two will be their age. And then radiographically, um, it'll be much more diffuse changes over the capitellum. So typically with an OCD, you're going to see a very focal lesion panners. It's going to look very largely abnormal. Um, and I, I don't recommend getting MRIs on panners kids because they're so young. Um, so I think it's going to be more diffuse. It's going to look like a very large osteochondral lesion. Um, so I think the combination of age, more diffuse elbow pain on exam, as well as the kind of diffuse changes in the capitellum are uh, what you'll see in that, that age group as well, too. Thank you, Nero, for that. And Nero, you mentioned about the surgical options of uh, osteochondral lesions. And I was just checking out a paper where you, I mean, oats normally you have as a graph from the knee, right? So Correct. when you're concerned about the mobility, some some of the surgeons have chosen a rib-based graft. Uh, I wonder if you've uh, come across those. I've, I've heard, read some reports about that as well, too. I think it, just as orthopedic surgeons, since we're so um, not comfortable operating that area, um, I think it's, it's uh, you know, we t have a tendency to, to not use it. I think if you have a, a general surgeon or someone who's comfortable or you do spine surgery and you're around the ribs, I think it's good. I think what a lot of people have have turned to now, and we need more and more data, is because people do, you know, some a certain percentage of kids will have knee pain after doing this, um, is osteochondral allograft, so using cadaver cartilage. Um, because it's a non weight bearing joint and you can get almost like a size match for that. Um, I think the outcomes have been just as good, you know, in some limited case series. So I, I've gone to using more allograft um, for that and, and kids have done well. Um, and I do think with a lot of these kids who are athletes, the last thing they want is then to have knee pain afterwards. So um, I do think that finding alternative graft sites um, are key, but a rib, yeah, I think that's, if, if you're comfortable around there, I think that would be good, but I just, I just don't like operating around that area. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank mm -hmm. you, Nero. Nero, I have just I was just looking at some of the papers that have been published on mm -hmm. the subject, and I noted a, a very high incidence of papers from Japan. Do you think this demographic uh, correlation, because in the U.S. and Japan, high I mean high intensity athletes are involving the upper extremity, even sports. I mean, I'm I i do not know whether what kind of sports do they. I mean, is it pitch uh, or baseball? What is it that uh, gives the higher incidence there? So I think part of it is that I think there are some studies that do show that that um, there is a higher incidence in general in the population for elbow OCDs. Um, and there's a huge baseball culture there as well, too. I think besides the U.S., Japan has a lot of upper extremity throwing athletes. So um, but even here, when I when I look at my patients here, that there is a higher predilection for for the Japanese patients to have it as well, too. So I think part of it's genetics, but I think a large part of it as well, too, is the baseball culture uh, there as well, too. And there's baseball there is really the main sport, um, unlike here in the U.S. So I think a lot of youth there when they're playing sports are, are playing it. So they're probably seeing more of it because of that as well, too. Thank you. Now, just one last question. Just regarding, you mentioned about that particular osteotomy called the closing wedge osteotomy with the <laughs> capital. Again, a lot of papers from Japan. and <laughs> But that is in contradiction to your paper, which says that, I mean, it, these uh, children have a higher degree of valgus. And again, you're going to do a closing wedge. It's going to increase the valgus, right? So that is yeah. quite contradictory, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I think that's we're still kind of learning a little bit about alignment. You know, I think it's, um, you know, there's, you see them radiographically what they have, you see this closing wedge. So I think that's why I think a lot of people don't do it, you know, and it's so the alignment around the elbow is so complex um, that I, I feel that there's, it, that it's it's not clear where where you should be making your osteotomy and how you're supposed to be doing it. So uh, to me, I really think about a lot of these kids, if you get alignment, it's more about addressing their dynamic part of it. And if you can offload it, um, I think we understand it a lot better in the knee. And that's why, you know, if you've got a lateral lesion, you, you do, a, you know, you correct your valgus and it makes sense. Around the elbow, there's just so much more degrees of motion, three-dimensional. So I agree, it doesn't necessarily correlate with what we find radiographically. Yeah. Thank you, Nirav. Nirav, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for yet another brilliant presentation and really look forward for another one later on. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.